$17 billion in fresh missile contracts signed in just 48 hours. Yet the Army's Dark Eagle hypersonic battery hasn't loosed a single live round in 18 months. Are we stockpiling range while real-world speed still sits on the launch pad? Congress just greenlit the biggest missile binge since Desert Storm. $7.8 billion split between Lockheed standoff killers and Raytheon's Amram dogfighters. One contract stuffs five lots of JASM and four lots of Lurasm into the pipeline for $4.3 billion. The other inks a record-setting $3.5 billion for the latest AIM 120s. The price tag hides an even bolder bet. Pentagon spreadsheets hint at 860 JASMs, 240 Lurasms, and up to 1,200 AMRAMs a year by 2026. Production rates the factories have never hit. Only $1.4 billion is obligated now, meaning the rest rides on next year's hill mood swings. Critics call it a surge on layaway. Warning inflation and supply chain choke points could boomerang costs. But champions say multi-year buys finally give industry the demand signal to double capacity or die trying. Next, Lockheed's Lurasm line must jump from 500 to 1,000 missiles a year. Can a single Florida plant carry the Pacific fight on its back? July 31st, contract add-on hurls another $9.5 billion onto Lockheed's JASM Lurasm omnibus, covering JASM lots 22 to 26 and Larasm lots 9 to 12 through 2033. The fine print orders capacity to leap from roughly 500 to 1,000 missiles a year by 2026, pressuring the Troy, Alabama line to run double shifts while still nursing solid rocket motor shortages and avionics backlogs. Foreign buyers, Poland, Finland, Japan, the Netherlands, grab slots too, meaning export deadlines now fight U.S. Indo-Pak stockpiles for every circuit board. Plant managers warn the surge isn't a dimmer switch, and any slip scares off the multi-year savings Congress is banking on. Next, while missiles boom, interceptors balloon, Thad just blew a $10 billion ceiling and nobody noticed. A July 28th contract tweak, modification P00105, vaulted Lockheed's Thad production deal from $8.3 billion to $10.4 billion, a $2.06 billion add-on that buys more interceptors through 2029 and obligates $285 million up front. The sticker shock lands as engineers still chase post-boost reliability fixes and as critics warn Thad can't touch glide boost hypersonics. Yet the Missile Defense Agency is paying nearly $180 million per battery reload, spreading work across four Lockheed plants from Dallas to Camden. Hill budget hawks mutter gold-plated Patriot, while Indo-Pak commanders swear by its 150-mile shield. If the price keeps climbing, Lawmakers may force a head-to-head -head duel with the newer next-gen interceptor, which promises bigger range at half the unit cost. Next, Space Force just handed five rivals a $4 billion anti-jam satellite pot. Can secrets stay secret when every contractor gets a slice? Space Systems Command just handed Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Viasat, Intelsat, and Astranus. Six-month design deals worth $37 million. The teaser tranche of a new $4 billion indefinite delivery indefinite quantity to build a protected tactical SATCOM global anti-jam constellation. The strategy, pit commercial speed against prime contractor pedigree, then down select for production launches in 2028. But giving five rival teams a peek at the same classified threat data has security lawyers sweating over spillover leaks. Officials insist competition will drive costs down. Skeptics hear a recipe for threaded NDAs and orbit-wide blame games if one satellite hiccups. Next, Air Force One just grabbed a $150 million cash injection to pull its overdue VC-25B to the flight line. Can fast money outrun a snarled wiring harness? The Pentagon's July omnibus reprogramming file yanks $150 million from lower priority accounts and hands it straight to the troubled VC-25B line. Gambling the cash can pull first delivery forward to 2027 instead of 2029. The money buys long lead wiring harnesses spares and mission equipment racks, precisely the parts Boeing says are pacing the whole jet. But acceleration comes with whiplash. Boeing has already written off $2.4 billion on the fixed price deal, and insiders whisper that a single week of rework on the presidential 747 burns $1 million in labor alone. Engineers still chase electrical power glitches traced to a cramped avionics bay, and corrosion touch-ups have slipped the structural test schedule by three more months. Congress must sign off on the transfer by September. If they balk, or if one more wiring snarl pops, the White House's flying bunker stays grounded. Next, 3,200 St. Louis machinists 
Vote on a strike that could choke the very parts pipeline the jet now depends on. It's no longer a countdown, it's a shutdown. As of August 4, about 3,200 IAM District 837 machinists at Boeing St. Louis, St. Charles, Missouri, and Mascouda, Illinois sites are on strike after rejecting a revised four-year deal. Boeing touted 40% average wage growth and a $5,000 bonus. Workers said it wasn't enough. The company has activated a contingency plan but admits disruption. So what's the immediate impact? Production on the F-15EX, F-A, 18EF, T-7A, and MQ-25 is hit. Exactly the lines the Pentagon needs to claw back range and tanker capacity. Boeing's CEO is playing down risk, yet analysts note every week lost echoes across already fragile delivery schedules. Local coverage shows pickets thick at Berkeley and beyond. The first strike of this unit in decades has real staying power. If the walkout drags, late 2025 milestones slip right with it, stacking on top of MQ-25 delays and pushing more bridge buys of missiles to fill the gap. Next, the F-35 program is already gambling on stopgap funding. Lot 21 long lead cash just went out the door while TR-3 still limps. The Navy just cut a $92.9 million check for long lead parts on the still undefinitized Lot 21 buy, essentially paying today for wing spars and radar racks that won't fly until 2031. The kicker? Every dollar backs foreign partners and FMS customers, not US squadrons, highlighting how Brussels and Tokyo now bankroll America's flagship fighter line. Lockheed must pre-stock components across nine sites from Fort Worth to Camary, Italy, while the core TR-3 avionics upgrade remains stuck in flight test purgatory. Advocates call it schedule armor. Critics call it pay now, pray later, noting that any further TR-3 slip could leave warehouses full of orphaned hardware. Next, a separate 72 million agile software sprint vows to unfreeze those avionics. Can code clear the runway before parts stack to the ceiling? On July 30th, Navair inked a $72.1 million deal that asks Lockheed's F-35 coders to sprint DevSecOps style and push a minimum viable capability release for the JET's combat data reprogramming tool by 2028. Only $4 million is funded now. Peanuts meant to stand up six scrum teams in Fort Worth and Orlando, but the promise is quarterly software drops that unlock Block 4 weapons while TR-3 hardware still lags. Champions hail it as an MVP before IOC model. Skeptics recall the ODIN logistics app that ate three years and $300 million before rebooting. The new contract's kill clause lets the Navy walk if sprint burndown charts slip more than 30 days, effectively dangling a sword over every backlog item. One program insider quips, miss a sprint, lose a tranche. If it works, park jets roll. If not, warehouse is already stuffed with lot. 21 parts become an expensive monument to code debt. Next, TR-3 bottleneck still cage 72 brand new fighters. Can the parking lot purge beat its own 2026 deadline? Lockheed finally rolled the last of 72 parked F-35s off its Texas aircraft farm, clearing a year-long logjam triggered by the glitch plague technology refresh 3 suite. The Pentagon resumed acceptances on May 1st after greenlighting a truncated TR-3 load that lets jets fly combat training, but still locks out key Block 4 weapons. The win isn't free. EOD is still withholding up to $3.8 million per jet. Cash released only when full-fat TR-3 software proves itself, likely late 2026. Until then, maintainers must juggle two configuration trees and pilots train on provisional displays that mask future sensor fusion. One JPO insider jokes, we uncork 72 bottles, but they're half filled with sparkling water. If another code hiccup hits, warehouses stuffed with lot 21 parts will outnumber ready cockpits, forcing the Navy to lean harder on cheaper ship killer missiles instead of stealthy strike fighters. Japan just stroked a $250 million direct commercial sale check so Mitsubishi Electric can license build Evolved Sea Sparrow Missile, ESSM, block two kits at home. Sticker shock followed instantly. Consortium navies run the math and see a 15% jump per missile versus last year's US full rate buy. Canada's budget planners call it creep we can't absorb, and Norway is already eyeing cheaper common anti-air modular missile, extended range, CAM-ER rounds for follow-on frigates. Why so pricey? The deal bundles tech transfer fees, Raytheon field reps, and a new solid-state seeker line in Nagoya. Cost the 12-nation program must now share. One European officer grumbles, we just paid for Tokyo's tooling. If partners balk, the Navy risks shrinking volume and spiking price again, precisely as land-based launchers start stealing the spotlight. Up next, Typhon just proved that theft. 
by firing an SM-6 from dirt and shaking Beijing's treaty playbook. On July 16, the Army's third multi-domain task force rolled its new Typhon mid-range capability launcher onto Australia's Bradshaw range and punched a standard Missile 6 straight through a moving target ship 250 miles offshore. The first land-based SM-6 kill west of the Dateline, China blasted the shot as new INF provocation, yet U.S. commanders called Typhon the missing link between HIMARS and Tomahawk, able to hurl both anti-ship and land attack rounds from a single ISO container. The live fire also validated joint Aussie-US targeting through a makeshift land effects coordination center, proving the battery can plug into any coalition sensor web within hours. But the real eye-opener? Typhon's next missile is already queued, the still-classified Prism Increment 4 Sea Strike variant. One Pacific commander teased, if you like the SM-6 splash, wait till you see what the new dart does to steel. Next, that new dart just drew blood. Prism went 310 miles and cracked a target hulk off Australia, but Pentagon sensors wiped the exact max range. During exercise Talisman Sabre 25 on Australia's Northern Territory coast, a U.S. HIMARS launcher lofted the newest precision strike missile and cracked a derelict barge 310 miles out to sea, by far the farthest live fire ever recorded for an army round. Lockheed's incremental four-seeker road shotgun, proving the dart can pivot from fixed land to moving maritime targets in one flight. Pentagon spokespeople scrubbed the exact max range, hinting only that future blocks exceed 400 kilometers. Australian officers grinned wider. Canberra just secured a co-production line that could feed both U.S. Indo-Pak stockpiles and its own missile sovereignty push. But success exposes a new headache. Each anti-ship prism costs roughly $15 million and choose the same solid rocket motors already short on JASM. If production chokes, the Indopac salvo plan tilts back to truck mobile launchers, racing island to island. Next, HIMARS just practiced that sprint, hopping to Christmas Island, firing, and ghosting out before satellites could blink. Recently, Exercise Talisman Sabre 25 turned the remote Christmas Island into a missile pit stop. A Royal Canadian Air Force C-17 hauled a U.S. HIMARS 2,000 miles from Darwin, rolled it onto a coral runway, launched a practice ripple, then reloaded and wheels up, all in under three hours. The pop-shoot-scoot drill proved the launcher can hop island airstrips faster than Chinese satellites refresh, while Allied crews stitched U.S., Australian, and Canadian fire control nets into one ad hoc Pony Express node. Commanders called it Guam without the bullseye, hinting every speck of rock across the Indo-Pac can now host precision fires on 24-hour notice. But HIMARS maxes out at 310 miles. DARPA's next plan straps a Mach 5 dart to the same truck. Can op fires rewrite island hopping range before 2030? DARPA's truck-launched hypersonic Dart just found fresh fuel money. L3, Harris announced on 17 July, plans to build a new large solid rocket motor campus in Camden, Arkansas, expressly sized for next generation boost crews and boost glide missiles. The move turns a quiet phase three lull into a sprint. Camden's line will pour variable thrust boosters that let op fires hit anything from 300 to 1,000 miles without the energy bleed suicide dive that doomed early tests. Program insiders say DARPA will fold Camden output into a Spiral 3B flight demo in fiscal year 2027, but only if the plant proves it can crank motors twice as fast as today's Troy, Alabama JASM line. Skeptics note the same ammonium perchlorate supply crunch that's squeezing Lorasm. L3, Harris vows an in-house propellant blend to dodge the choke point. If Camden slips or Congress balks at yet another hypersonic factory, the Navy's brand new missile drone boats may steal the Indopac spotlight next. The Navy's July 28th RFI cracked open a once black project called Modular Attack Surface Craft or MASC, a fast 65-meter drone boat that can sprint 25 knots for 2,500 nautical miles while lugging two 40-foot ISO containers wired for 75 kilowatts apiece. Those boxes aren't shipping sneakers. They're hot swappable launch cells, 32 Mark 70 VLS tubes today, a containerized SPY-6 radar or high-energy laser tomorrow. Program boss Captain Matt Lewis calls MASC a Lego destroyer for every island, hinting the fleet could scatter missile barges from Guam to Palau for pennies on a Burke's dollar. Sticker price stays classified, but the RFI's other transaction authority wording lets NAVC skip normal bidding rules. Hill staff already mutter Shadow LCS sequel. Contractors have 60 days to pitch hull forms and autonomy brains. The first demo hull must sail by fiscal year 27 or lose funding.
If MASC slips, destroyer captains keep begging for billion dollar sensor refits instead. Next, those captains just dropped a $3 billion wish list called DDG Modernization 2.0. Will Congress swallow another gold plated upgrade? Nav C's destroyer Modernization 2.0, briefed to industry last week, sketched an eye watering $17 billion master plan to drag 20 aging Flight 2A Burks into the Spy 6, Sea Whip Block 3, laser ready era two ships a year starting fiscal year 29. But the first bite is the shocker, a $3 billion FY26 starter kit the Navy wants in the next budget to lock by the initial spy, six version four radar sets, integrated combat system racks, and 300 miles of fiber optic cable before inflation snowballs. Hill sources say each of the first four holes will absorb $750 million in sensors, power cooling upgrades, and combat system rewiring, triple the cost of a midlife cruiser overhaul. Program boss Captain Tim Moore insists the crawl-walk-run approach and a single 18-month yard period will dodge the cruiser modernization fiasco. Yet congressional staff already mutter, zoom while deja vu, if costs burst early. If lawmakers balk at that $3 billion down payment, or if Spy 6 production slips again, the whole two-per-year schedule collapses, leaving Indo-Pak destroyer gaps just as China's type 055 fleet surges past a dozen hulls. Next, Senate appropriators just torpedoed the Air Force's plan to kill the E-7 Wedgetail. Are surface air politics about to detonate on the House floor? The Senate Appropriations Panel just slammed the brakes on the Air Force's kill order, plowing $647 million into the FY26 draft bill to keep the E-7 Wedgetail radar jet alive. Lawmakers call the plane non-negotiable air cover after Beijing's bomber swarm drills, reversing DOD plans to pivot to space-only surveillance. But rescuing the program doesn't fix its headaches. Unit cost has climbed from $588 million to $724 million. Survivability upgrades are still paper thin, and Boeing warns the first USAF airframe won't fly before 2028. If delays stretch again, Congress may yank funding as fast as it restored it, exactly the budget whiplash that just turned a service pistol into a headline. Congress may have just saved the Air Force's eyes in the sky, but the Navy's legs are still cramping. Wedgetail will spot the fight. Without a deck-based tanker, the strike package can't can't reach it. Carrier captains keep juggling fuel math, edging closer to DF-26 range rings than they like. The fix was supposed to be simple. Fly the Stingray, stretch the wing, push the threat line back. Which brings us to the bad news. The Boeing MQ-25 Stingray slips again. Now, with an initial operational capability by 2027. Last week's Navy budget update quietly pushed the MQ-25 Stingray's initial operational capability date from fiscal year 26 to fiscal year 27, marking the program's third schedule slip since 2023. The latest GAO tally shows development costs up 38% year over year and a 290 $1 million funding shortfall driven by obsolescent avionics and seven must-replace components still in redesign. Ground testing resumed this week in St. Louis, but carrier qualification flights now wait until mid-2026, two years later than Boeing promised when it won the contract. And about those promises, we will fly MQ-25 in 25. You can quote me on that. We will fly that platform in 25 and get that thing on a carrier in 26 and start integrating it, said Vice Admiral Daniel Cheever back in January of 2020. 25. Duly quoted, every month of drift gouges the carrier air wings range. Without Stingray gas, Super Hornets lose 300 nautical miles of strike reach, forcing decks to steam closer to DF-26 kill zones. Naval Air Systems Command estimates each extra year burns $120 million in contractor overhead alone. One fleet planner groans, our tankers are stuck in dry dock, China's bombers are not. Next, with drones delayed and jets grounded, the Pacific range gap widens. Are hypersonic salvos now the fleet's only life raft? A billion dollar boom in missiles, a billion dollar bleed in software, and a current labor walkout, every domino stands wobbling at once. If Congress trims one multi-year buy, Lockheed surge lines stall. If the Union blinks, fighter parts freeze. If TR-3 slips again, the Pacific carrier deck loses 300 nautical miles overnight. China's Type 055 destroyers already outrange a Burke by 200 miles. Add Dark Eagle's flightless year and the gap widens to a full day's steaming. The Pentagon is betting that hypersonic salvos and container boat arsenals will close the distance before Beijing does. But the clock is moving faster than the production lines. Should Congress double down on missile factories or slam the brakes until software and unions catch up? Drop your war room take below because the next budget vote may decide whose range wins the Indo-Pak chessboard.